we can start. Um, so everyone, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Amber Simpson, who is a professor at Queen's University in the departments of Biomedical and Molecular Sciences, as well as uh, Computing. She's also a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Biomedical Computing and Informatics. Um, her research interests are primarily in cancer, machine learning, and uh, medical image analysis. And today she'll be giving us a talk about uh, solving fundamental biomedical problems with AI. Um, and I'm really happy to, to have her here today. You're usually really far, Amber, so it's great that we can we can hang out in person or online, I guess. Um, really wonderful to meet you and to hear about your research. Thank you. So one problem I have with giving these Zoom talks is that you can't actually see the people that are in the that are here and your slides at the same time. So I'll try to kind of manage both, but it's very weird because you're speaking into the ether. Um, anyways, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm also a member of the Canada, the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, which is really exciting. Um, and I have a long history of doing cancer research. And there we go. Um, so my lab does a number of different things. So I think of myself as an, an applied computational scientist. So we do things like, um, you know, doing crowdsource challenges, which we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, we do things like, here, let me just reorganize my screen a bit because now I can't see my slides. There we go. Um, we do things like uh, biomarker discovery and validation. Uh, we also design algorithms for analyzing biomedical data. And then we also try to develop some new algorithms. Um, there we go. I think that'll work now. Is that going to work? There we go. So our team uh, right now is um, straddling New York and Kingston. Um, I have still some postdocs and some students that are in New York City uh, from my previous position. And then I came back to Queens uh, almost a year ago now. Um, and now I've hired a bunch of students and we're growing the lab in Queens. Uh, so the new lab is a lab in progress. It takes a while to, to get from one country to the next and we're building. And we've been slowed down a little bit by COVID, uh, but we've managed to get all the data to Queens, which is exciting from the US. Um, and we've managed to get all the transfer agreements all set up and to really get things going. Um, but it does take a little while. And so I, I come from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, which is considered, uh, which is the oldest cancer center in the world and considered one of the best. Um, I work quite a bit with the clinicians there. This is my colleague in radiology that I've done almost all of my work with. Um, and really everything you're going to see today is as a result of collaborations with a number of clinicians and a lot of students and research fellows and clinical fellows that really had to annotate a lot of data. So please don't think that this is all entirely my, my own work that I rely on a big collaboration and a big team to get a lot of this done. So just to put this into perspective, uh, so Sloan Kettering is consistently ranked as, as the top cancer center in the world. And I was uh, a computa considered a computational biologist, even though I'm not actually a co computational biologist, but they didn't have any other titles there because they didn't have computer scientists that worked at the hospital. Um, and I was appointed in the Department of Surgery. So I was in a clinical program, uh, running a you know, building and running my own research program. And so I supervised students from Cornell, which was across the street, Cornell's medical school, um, and worked you know, within a clinical department. And I think you'll know Sloan Kettering. Uh, it's known for a couple of AI things that are significant. One is that Sloan Kettering was the first collaborator of IBM Watson. So they were the very first ones to sign on with IBM Watson and they worked with IBM Watson for many years and this, you know, we can debate the success of IBM Watson, uh, but that was really something um, that Sloan Kettering tried to work on for a really long time and invest in this idea of AI. And so, so to me, uh, you know, Watson sort of represents an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting thing that happened in the field. So I remember working in the clinical department and my chief came to me and said, oh, Amber, you should come to these Watson meetings with me. They're asking me to do things and I think we could collaborate with them. Uh, so come to this meeting. So I went to that meeting. And so the, the IBM Watson team were asking my chief, who's a surgeon, 
to go through clinical vignettes. So each piece of paper that they had was a vignette about a patient and they wanted him to say, you know, what would you do with this patient? So he would read the piece of paper. So we're, so we're sitting and he's got this stack of pieces of paper and he's going through them and, and he looks at the first sheet of paper and it says, you know, um, 29 year old female diagnosed with hepatocellular carcinoma, what would you do with her? Would you take her to resection or would you transplant her? And he would invariably say, this is not a patient that's gonna get liver cancer. This patient's too young and she's female. Like, this is not a patient that I see. Oh, okay, we'll just, you know, we'll throw that one out and we crumple it up and throw it out. And so, uh, you know, we proceed to go through this stack and I said, you know, we have the 30,000 patients that we've seen in this service. We could just give you the data. We've been keeping track of what happened to all of our patients. We have all their laboratory values. We have all this information. We could just give you the data instead of you trying to infer that data from, uh, from a clinician, right? You can do a data-driven approach. And their response was really interesting to me. They said to me, they said, Amber, that's not how IBM Watson works. And they, they kind of poo-pooed me a little bit. And I said, oh, okay, I guess we're not collaborating with IBM Watson because they're not interested in actually looking at the real data. And that to me um, really exemplified some of the challenges with IBM Watson and sort of the lack of progress in, in that field. Um, the other thing that happened at Sloan Kettering while I was there is there was a series of New York Times articles about uh, a startup that came out of Sloan Kettering called PageAI. And it was started by the pathology department. And this was a, a big deal when it happened. Um, gosh, I think that happened almost two years ago now. And it was because the pathology department was essentially selling their data to the company. And the, on, the, on the board of the company uh, was the head of the pathology department as well as some other, the CEO of the hospital and other people. So they were essentially you know, poised to get money from clinical data, personal money from, the, from clinical data, which, which caused not only a problem for you know, the public, but also for people working in the pathology department. They felt like all of their hard work was being sold. And so that was something that really stifled creativity in the AI space in the hospital and, and, and um, part of the reason that I left. Um, and one other thing to say about Sloan Kettering is they're kind of the, the, the kings of the health data silo. They have more cancer data than anybody else and it's really hard to get them to share it with anybody. And so, you know, what you experience in the US is much different than what you experience in Canada, right? That, that the health data is really owned by the specific institution. There's no you know, government oversight of that that says you have to upload your data somewhere. And so the ability to transport data from one institution to another is really quite limited and something that you have to, you have to negotiate pretty heavily. Um, so my lab does a lot of work in, in what you call the radiomics or radio genomics space. So this idea that you can take a CT or MRI scan, you can, extract some features from it, and then you can create predictive um, algorithms for what to do with patients. And so we do a lot of work in that. Um, we are evaluating some of these ideas in clinical trials. So we have um, trials open right now in pancreas cancer, in colorectal liver metastases, and cholangiocarcinoma, which is a really aggressive, primary, aggressive and rare primary liver cancer. And we're evaluating radiomics that we've developed in the lab um, and using it as a correlative study in cancer trials. So we do a lot of that kind of work that's funded by the National Cancer Institute in the US. Um, we do some work in computational pathology uh, where we take digital pathology slides. You know, this is a lot of the type of work that Ann Martell does as well. And then we use that to define new patterns of cancer to try to look at subtypes of cancer. So we do, you know, a whole, um, uh, uh, we do whole things related to those ideas. But I think what I wanna talk about today and uh, is the idea that AI is pretty irrelevant in clinical practice. So your standard clinician is not gonna deal with an AI in their day. And that's, you know, and, and, and so what I wanna talk about is how we can think about using AI to solve really fundamental problems. So I've, I'm using it to solve some specific clinical problems uh, in my lab and we're evaluating those in trials. But I think what we wanna talk about today is, is a bigger picture of what we could potentially do with it. And the other thing I want to talk about is how we can really use the current focus on AI to change patient care and really actually influence what happens to a patient. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about solving the image segmentation problem um, and using that to track cancer progression. 
and how we really in Canada are fundamentally positioned to do some interesting work in AI um, to compare and contrast with the Americans a little bit. So let's start with talking about imaging, image segmentation. So this is a CT scan of the liver. Um, and you know, a lot of what we do in my lab is we take this and we mine it for predictive and prognostic information to try to figure out what happens to a patient, what treatment we should give the patient. Um, and we do that by studying pixel patterns within the liver, for example, because these pixel patterns are related in some way to underlying biology. And if we can capture those pixel patterns in some way, then, you know, we can um, provide some biomarker for, for uh, managing these patients. And so all of that work really um, is contingent on an image segmentation. So our ability to find um, and annotate the extents of, for example, the liver or a liver tumor or a lung tumor or something like this. And this is a, a really a foundational problem in medical image analysis. Um, and so you really need to do this as a first step before you can do anything else. If you try to get somebody to do this by hand, it takes a really long time, even if they just have to uh, provide an initialization to this process, you know, just downloading a scan takes a few minutes, you know, clicking on it takes more time, generating the data and propagating it and checking it takes even more time. And so even with semi-automatic um, methods, you know, to, for a human to sit and do this, it still takes like 40 minutes per scan, which is just not scalable. Um, and so this is what we're interested in. We're interested in, in defining regions of interest within a scan. And so, you know, I don't have to tell this group about how open science revolutionized computer vision uh, by essentially solving the object recognition problem, right, with a series of grand challenges. And so that's what we uh, endeavored to do with medical images. And so this came about, um, a discussion at Mackay 2017 that I had uh, with George Cordoza from University College London. And it went a little something like this, it, you know, wouldn't it be cool to just solve the medical image segmentation problem like we solve, like the computer vision community solved the object recognition problem. And George said, yeah, that would be great, but nobody's got that kind of data. And I said, well, actually I do have that kind of data and we could do this. And so we endeavored um, to, to uh, do the uh, Mackay Medical Segmentation Decathlon. You can look this up online. Um, the, all this data is still publicly available. And we put together a team from DeepMind, um, from the Technical University of Munich, Radboud, the German Cancer Center, University of Pennsylvania, Vanderbilt, and others to really get into this idea of solving the image segmentation problem uh, with a grand challenge. So the challenge took place at Mackay 2018 and the idea was to develop a semantic segmentation algorithm or a learning system that can solve 10 segmentation tasks separately without any kind of human input. And so the idea is that this could really generate an image net for medical images. And you can download this data. It's all available at medicaldecathlon.com. Um, and the data sets were uh, a variety of different organs of interest, organs, tumors, things like that of interest. Um, and I provided five of them from my group, and we had that data because of this long history that we have of, of biomarker development in imaging, from imaging. Um, and so in total, we had about 2,600 CT scans in this challenge, and then I, a, a, almost half of them were provided by our group. And then the design was that we released seven data sets. So there was a test and training set within each of the seven data sets. And the idea was that your algorithm had to generalize to the other three data sets that would be released later in the test phase of the whole challenge. And so this meant that you couldn't fiddle with your algorithm between, between tasks, right? The algorithm that you used on one, you had to use on the other. And there were ways that we had of, of controlling for that. Um, and this was really the first, I, the first time anybody tried to do generalizable medical image segmentation. Um, and so what was really great about this is that we showed that you could actually do it, that we had three teams that did extremely well across all of the, uh, across all of the different data sets, across all 10 data sets. Um, and so this is um, their score. And so the score is basically um, a dice metric, which just measures overlap in the images. 
Um, and you can see that these three teams actually did pretty well. And what was really interesting is if you actually dug into how well each team did. So this is the how well the winner did. Um, so there were all different data sets within this, right? So we kind of broke down the analysis by task and, and dug into things uh, related to that. And so uh, some of them are incredibly hard. So I released a data set of colon cancer tumors and they're impossible to see. Like they're, if you looked at the CT scan, you would not be able to figure out where it is. And so you can see that that task didn't do very well. The volume dice on that task was uh, 0.56. And the, there was another uh, metric that we had of boundary dice, which was, which for the colon task at the bottom there is 0.67. Um, but in some other of the data sets, it really, they, the algorithms reach state of the art performance. So um, the pancreas, so the ability to just draw a boundary around the pancreas itself, um, reached a dice of 0.795, which is better than state of the art in the field. And so it was, uh, it was really interesting that not only could they generalize, but also that they could really do better than the state of the art in the field. And so um, at Mackay, we had this, because uh, you know, computer scientists love their hardware. So we did like an Oprah style giveaway of uh, graphic of uh, GPUs. So if you had an NVIDIA sticker under your chair, you got a, you know, you got a GPU. And so people thought that was, that was great. And they, they loved it. And I definitely recommend that approach. And now that data set has been integrated into the NVIDIA Clara platform. So it's part of the, the SDK. So if you're doing anything that's imaging based, if you're using Clara, you can get that data natively as part of Clara. But you can also, you know, download that data separately and work with it. And our plan is really to keep, you know, rolling that data out. So we have a plan. Um, I think starting next year, we'll do a DO decathlon, which it will be 20 data sets. And then we'll keep expanding this um, as we go along and, and adding, um, you know, you can imagine adding not just segmentations, but add you know, what happened to the patient, right? So then you could start doing prediction of outcome in future challenges. And so I think what we're going to do next year is make it a, a cancer challenge. So that way that we can start to say, you know, let's do segmentation of cancer and then we can relate it to cancer outcome in future years and really try to dig into solving the image segmentation problem. Because I think that that is ripe for solving. We're really close to solving it. And there are individual labs that have done a good job of solving parts of it. Um, but I think together we can really revolutionize, uh, re revolutionize this uh, foundational problem. And you know, I, I say this is not the group that needs to hear this because you all know about data sharing. But I tell you, when I go to clinical groups and I say to them, sharing data may not solve everything, but hoarding data has solved nothing that is a really revolutionary idea to them because for them, you know, the data is the thing that they've built their career on and they don't necessarily want to give you access to that because it means that they will no longer have a career. And that's a pretty, you know, that's a big thing for them. So negotiating access to that data is a really big deal. Um, but the idea here is that you have a, a semantic segmentation network, right? So you've got this network and then you can just start feeding it data. And um, that data could come from the cancer trials group, whom I'm a part of. It could come from a, a hospital. Um, I have quite a bit of data from Sloan Kettering that, uh, that we can also annotate. And then you could imagine that you can have federated networks, right? And so we have a nice collaboration with University of Pennsylvania now to build federated networks. Lots of other people um, are talking about federated networks now for looking at medical data, because in that way, you don't have to move the data, you can move the network, right? And it gets you around some of the issues with protected health information. Uh, and so, so those are a lot of the things that we're thinking about now. So, okay, so I talked about solving image segmentation, but now I wanna talk about how we could apply that to tracking cancer progression. Um, and so in cancer, the way that we have of figuring out whether someone's responded to chemotherapy or not is uh, using criteria called RESIS, the response evaluation in, uh, in solid tumors. And these are published results that help us uh, assess disease burden. And we only do this on cancer trials. 
Um, so if you're enrolled in a cancer clinical trial, you'll actually get recess criteria done by the radiologist. It's documented separate from the standard radiology report. And the reason why this came about uh, is because oncologists needed a way to reliably and reproducibly uh, compare you know, response rates to different chemotherapies. And so the way that they do this uh, is as follows. So the, the radiologist uh, identifies the measurable tumors, they pick the biggest one, and they provide unidimensional measurements and they report that measurement. And so they do this by hand, right? They actually have to take a ruler, um, a virtual ruler and draw it across the tumor. Um, and then they do this again in the follow-up scans. So the patient you know, comes in, gets their scan, then they get a bunch of chemotherapy, then they get another scan. And we do these measurements to figure out the differences in the tumor sizes based on whatever chemotherapy. Um, but the problem with this, of course, is that it's incredibly time consuming, right? And this is why it's only done on cancer trials. And uh, so this means that our knowledge about how cancer patients respond to chemotherapy is lacking in the general cancer population. So if you're on a cancer clinical trial, we know how you respond. If you're not, then we really don't capture that information in any way. And the reason is just that it would take a really long time. So that means that, like, if you think about clinical trials, what we do is we take uh, strict inclusion and exclusion criteria to bring people into those trials. But then once it's approved within that context, you can really use that drug outside of, you can use it off label, right? And so now you've got this drug that you don't really know, like in the general population, how it's going to work, but we also don't capture that within how we design trials or within the healthcare system. So what we endeavor are endeavoring to do is, is to really um, dig into this idea of a cancer twin. So a cancer twin is essentially a digital replica of a cancer patient. Um, and so for us, this means that we want to generate a labeled database of disease burden um, across all different cancer types. So you look like, how can you capture this across every cancer type and every type of patient, right? That's, so these are just general patients that come to the hospital that receive treatment that aren't necessarily on those cancer trials. And so if you could do that, you would wind up with a database of response and progression rates and mixed response. And then you could start looking at like how do patients, you know, how do patients in this subpopulation uh, respond to this chemotherapy that everybody gets for this other type of cancer. And that's something you really can't do now. And so uh, Sloan Kettering has structured radiology reports. So these are uh, reports where the radiology department uh, invested in the idea that they should standardize their reporting. And so they came up with terminology that they agreed on, and then this is built into a structured reporting format. And so they have different fields that they have to fill in. The fields are all completely standardized. There's a little bit of free text in the reports, but it's not like it used to be where it was really just all free text. And so they've been doing this for about uh, a little over 10 years. So they have 400,000 reports and they also have uh, the corresponding CTs for those reports, the, C the CT scans. And then this um, corresponds to about 50,000 different patients undergoing all different types of cancer treatment. So this is what a report looks like. So this is, um, you would have all of these different sections for the spleen, pancreas, adrenal gl glands. And this again is all structured. So the meaning of unremarkable is defined. And then anything that's written in these different sections is all defined. It's defined with pull down menus and that kind of thing. Um, and so then you also have an impression section, and this is where the free text comes in, right? So the, this is where the radiologists can now go in and just do some free text. So there's an obvious opportunity here to do natural language processing, right? And so this means that for each patient, we have this really great collection of sequential CT scans, you know, throughout their chemotherapy treatment. And then we also have a structured report for each of the CT scans. So I can tell you that, that downloading 400,000 CT scans is not that easy, right? And it's taking us an incredible amount of time to transfer that data to our lab to be able to work with it. But getting at the structured reports is very easy and doing analysis, doing NLP of those structured reports is something that is, is much more tractable. So we've done quite a bit of work there. Um, and this is uh, all of my students were at Karen Batch and my collaborator at Queen's, uh, Farhana Zalkardine. And so we're looking at evaluating 
natural language uh, processing for labeling metastatic disease. And we decided to sort of initially try a smaller cohort so that we could demonstrate that we could actually do this kind of thing. Um, so we had, so we decided to just look at colorectal cancer because there's lots of patients. Um, and this is just as a, like a preliminary step to see if we can actually, it's to determine feasibility. So we took uh, almost 2000 reports and manually reviewed them and actually had uh, the radiology fellows review um, and review the scans. So they had to look at the report and they had to look at the scan. And this was our ground truth, right? That they actually went through and reviewed um, whether or not there were metastases in the lung, pleurus, lean kidneys, adrenal, the mesentery, the peritoneum, uh, in pelvic organs, in bones, just, you know, um, they looked at different, they looked at lymph nodes, that kind of thing. And then we had another 400 that we did for our testing data. And what we found is that our, um, when we actually tried to build a model to do this, to be able to, to predict um, metastatic disease in these colon cancer patients, we got really good precision and recall um, for the places in the body where you see a lot of metastases. So the liver, lungs, and mesentery, we get a lot of metastases there. So there's a lot of data to work with. And of course, this precision goes down when you're talking about ad adrenals and pelvic organs, because that's a really uncommon site of metastases. And we submitted this to RSNA. This is um, really a first shot at this data, but it's to capture this much bigger idea that you could analyze all of this data and really track different patterns of progression in these cancer patients. And that work is ongoing. And then, you know, it really gets into endless possibilities. And so we're also working, um, we just got a, a New Frontiers exploration grant from SHRC uh, on uh, developing cancer twins and also looking at identity in the cancer twin. So, you know, getting into the ethical component of this and whether or not we should be making cancer twins, right? It's, it's a huge thing. Like if you went in for your cancer treatment and your doctor said to you, look, we could give you this therapy. We already know it's not going to work for you. You know, are you going to take that therapy? Are you going to, are you going to undergo that aggressive cancer surgery? Um, you know, would you want an AI to tell you how long you have to live? And and broadly, she really digs into how to address existential threats of AI and cancer. And so I think that's a, a really cool topic and it's a, a very interesting collaboration. And I think it's fascinating that I'm funded by SHRC. Um, but so this is ongoing work, but it's to hopefully capture your imagination a little bit about how we could uh, look at data that we can't look at in any other ways, but look at it with AI. Um, and so I'm going to just move to talking a little bit about why Canada is so well positioned to do this kind of work and to contrast it a little bit with the US, right? So this is the reason that I came back to Canada. We all have one of these. Uh, this is the old health card. I have a new one now. I got it. Uh, the ministry didn't like that I still had this card when I came back. Um, but we all have this, right? And we carry this around and this is our identifier that connects all of our health information. This doesn't exist in the US at all. So if you're a patient um, at, at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and then you're a patient, you know, you have a primary care physician that's across the street, you're going to get a different number associated with both of those places. So there's no way to track you through the system. So, um, you know, as you're going around and retrieving different treatments, there's really no way to know who is what. There's also... Um, you know, the great thing about Ontario is that we're a single payer insurance. A lot of people think that we have universal access to care. That's not actually true. We have single payer health insurance. This is delivered by OHIP. Um, and the hospitals are not for profit private corporations. And so the funding model is much different, right? Whereas in the US, each hospital is just looking out for themselves and just trying to make their own profits for their own board. Um, and so in, in Ontario specifically, we have uh, Cancer Care Ontario, which is now, it's called something different now, and it oversees cancer care delivery in, in the province, right? And they, the surgical oncology program manages access to care and funding to all the institutions. So there's a linkage between funding, um, you know, and recovering, you know, the, the hospital billing and this idea of coordinated data. And then we have the Cancer Trials Group, which is located at Queen's, but they design and administer cancer trials across Canada and actually across the world. Um, and they centralize the collection of the 
the specimen of those patients and also all of their health data. So all of their CT scans and things like that. So where um, some other databases have more administrative data, the, the cancer trials group people really have the deep data. So all the sequencing data, all the imaging and that, that kind of good stuff. And then we have the ICS data as well as now the Ontario Health Data Platform, right? Where you can really access uh, episodic health data. So every time somebody goes to the doctor, you can access, um, you know, you can access all of that great administrative data. And then we have Sipson, right? And so all of these different databases are actually located at Queens. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons why, uh, why I wanted to come back because I felt like I was trying to negotiate with all of these different American hospitals. And then it was like, oh, well, actually Canada's just doing this anyways, because it's the right thing to do. And then of course, I don't have to tell you that we're doing really cool things in AI across the country. And so I'm going to stop there and, uh, you know, I like to think that what I do is bridge this gap. So I work in this um, big crater where the river is between clinicians and the computing community to try to do applied work. Um, and I try to show clinicians that there is other work that can be done with their data that is amazing. Um, and I try to bring some of that data to the commu computing community to try to bridge the gap because my goal in life is really to cure cancer. Um, and so how do we do that with computational strategies? And with that, I will leave you with uh, one of my favorite um, graphics about IBM Watson and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Oh look, I have applause. Sorry, I'm just taking time to read through this. This is, <laughs> this is <hard. laughs> yeah. The the clinicians really like that it ends in perform autopsy. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, there's some other really funny ones in there. Um. So I guess I'll give other folks some time to think of a question. But yeah, I just want to say, Amber, like this, it's really, um, it's really amazing to see that you know com computer vision and NLP and all these different things can come together um, to try to solve cancer. Because in my when I had before I came to Vector, I thought of all these different applications of AI is like very separate. And I was like, okay, well, there's computer vision here, but like you guys wouldn't be interested in this NLP stuff, right? And it was all very kind of separated. And so it's always really great to see these projects that actually like bring all this stuff together. Um, and I wonder um, when you find researchers to help you on various projects, do you have to like, like pluck them from somewhere and like convince them to come over or are people generally very interested in kind of moving, moving across uh, different areas of machine learning? Um, I usually give a talk and people get really excited because I have data, right? And so, and people want data. And I have, you know, one of the things that I do a lot in my research program is I try to reduce access to barriers to data, which is really hard to do. And so if I'm spending the time doing the regulatory, I try to do it right so that we can then share the data. And one of the things, for example, that we did in that decathlon challenge was we tried to make it a challenge that people with no image analysis experience could do. So we formatted all the images in such a way that if you were a straight up ML person that had never done any imaging, you didn't have to worry about DICOM and other proprietary formats for imaging. You could just download those images and get to it the way that you do with natural images from ImageNet, right? And so it's easy to work with me because I, I take the brunt of a lot of that work. And then I say, here is this data perfectly formatted. Here is the database of all of the patient outcomes and all of the laboratory values. Now go do the thing that only you can do, right? And so it's actually, I find it really easy to negotiate these types of collaborations, but it's a lot of work. Like you have to show the clinicians, look, Look at what I did with somebody else's data set. I showed that we can tell the difference between these types of patients. And then they get excited because they say, oh, well, maybe you can do that with my patients and my problem. And then you show them that. And then they just, they all freak out. They get so excited because they just want to have better options for their patients. And so it's like both the computing people, you know, that are, you know, like computer scientists like me that you got to bring on board, but you also have to bring on 
the clinical people and the people that are acquiring the data and the students and, and everybody else. So you, you spend a lot of time kind of negotiating these different types of things. Interesting. So there's quite a bit of, I guess, translation involved in like just orienting the problem in a way that specific stakeholders will understand. Yeah. And you, you know, you have to, to get the clinicians to kind of elucidate the problem. And like some of it is just going to clinical meetings and saying, oh, that thing right there is actually really easy for us. But then they'll say like, they'll be like, oh, well, can you do this thing? And you have to say, that problem, if I solve that problem, I will get the Turing Award. So that one is not something <laughs> that we're gonna solve today. <laughs> you know, and I think that's really probably the, the most interesting and important parts is knowing kind of the end of your knowledge and the start of someone else's knowledge and, you know, being able to translate between those. So Amber, I have a question if no one else has. I don't want to hog your time because I can talk to you anytime. But um, <laughs> so you're saying it's taken you a long, long time to get this data from MSK to, to Kingston. And then if you ever get a chance to share it, then it takes a long time. And my guys spend weeks and weeks downloading digital pathology data, for example, and things yeah. from the cloud. So in the US, they're trying to set up various different imaging commons and things like that, where the concept is that the data gets uploaded onto the cancer imaging archive, for example, and then we co-locate computing. I mean, do you think there's any potential for the Canadian government coming up with a necessary hard cold cash to set anything like that up? Yeah, I mean, so we were at this, uh, uh, um, oh, actually, no, it wasn't the Ontario Health Data Platform user group. It was actually a discussion that I had um, in person with my new Dean of Health Sciences, Jane Philpott, who's also the advisor to the Ontario Health Data Platform. And she said to me, Amber, why aren't we pushing all the imaging data? Like imaging data is the most important thing in COVID right now. You know, the, the administrative data is great and we can do some interesting thing with the administrative data, but the, the imaging data is hugely important. And so if the government said, let's just upload all the imaging data, that becomes a totally different thing that I never even considered in the US that the government could just say, okay, we're going to make this available and then it, it's done. Yeah, so Ontario imaging data, a lot of it is actually on HDERS, which mm -hmm. is, I can't remember what that stands for. Um, I'm actually trying to figure out even how to get my own Sunnybrook data back off HDERS because it turns out that we crash the hospital PAC system if we try and request it through their portal and we haven't got a pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I think a bunch of us have to get together and start. Yeah, and I'm actually requesting uh, for an, a TCIA equivalent in Canada. Yeah, I think and I, I'm involved in the NIH Data Commons as well, and I know that the head of the NIH Data Commons is a friend of mine. And it was really funny. So they started, so they started the Data Commons, the Health Data Commons first for all of NIH, and they thought, you know, that they would just be able to come in and within a year they would have a Data Commons. And, and I remember talking to them and just laughing like, ha ha ha, you know how hard this is? Do you know how hard the TCIA works to do all of these things? And then, you know, now three years later, they're like, oh yeah, that was really hard. And they started their own imaging, the, the cancer imaging commons. And so, um, so I think they're realizing how hard it is, but TCIA is impossible to work with. Like I work with TCIA and they are great people but they don't have the resources to be able to really put everything out there. And, you know, it, it's just such a barrier to access um, that it's really unbelievable. And I think, yeah, I do want to do a, a, a cancer a data commons. And I think that I can get the cancer trials group to do that. And I think if we had somebody like the cancer trials group come forward and say, okay, we're going to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is a cost thing. So I, I've been asked to join the external advisory board of, I can't remember what the thing is called now, the information, where they're trying to co-locate the computing power with the imaging data as well. Mm -hmm. And the cost of just, and well, you know this from Memorial Sloan Kettering, the cost of making sure that data is anonymized and there's no HPI on it is, is enormous. Mm -hmm. So I don't Because know the we... fines are enormous. You know, like Columbia yeah. got a $5 million fine for accidentally sharing PHI, right, through... Um, they accidentally 
you know, they, in one of these radiology um, learning groups that they have, they accidentally put a, an MRN on the screen and it cost them $5 million. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think we can do it. And I think that we're people that want to do it in this country. And I've thought about, you know, obviously we can talk about this online, offline doing like a Terry Fox, you know, they're already supporting infrastructure to do that kind of thing, but they're not, I don't think anybody else is really thinking about the imaging and what it's really going to practically take to get the imaging up, the pathology and the radiology. Um, I think <laughs> pathology, pathology is even worse because yeah. the images are so much bigger. So yeah. 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 Yeah, and I, uh, but I think we can do it because I think Canadians think it's the right thing to do. Whereas the Americans, I mean, you can't even get them to agree that they should be able to go to the doctor, right? Never mind, go to the doctor and share data too. Yeah, so I think Vector Institute would be very important in, mm. in being part of this. I know they are pushing towards it as well. And Sifar are probably are pushing as well. So I guess we just need to to figure out how to do it. I mean, at the moment, we're just doing smaller things. Mm. The other big big thing that's difficult i mean you know you're saying that all the data exists but my experience with ics is that they will not release data that can be linked to an individual patient mm -hmm. and that of course kills any image analysis so i know yeah. again the hpc for health are trying to figure out how to sort this out and things like that but but that so isis will let you have data if you, know, you can say how many people in this this area have this disease etc but if you try and say right i want to have the death statistics for this image the problem is that you know the patient, someone knows who that image is, and then they won't release that data, they're not allowed to. So there are still yeah. some major hurdles to overcome in, in linking Yeah, it. and I think to my earlier point, I think some of that is governmental, that they, the government just has to set policy around that. And then I also think about for myself, what I can do day to day, right? Like what is the day to day thing that I can do to try to push this forward? And there's obviously the grand challenges route, but there's also for this Ontario health data platform, just having a couple of base hits with that data to demonstrate to the Ministry of Health that there is value in getting data out there. And so I think a lot about that too, like how can we just have a solid, you know, home runs nice, but what, what about a, just a good solid base hit and really show the value of having data to the, to the taxpayer and then things start to really move. I see a person, do you want to ask your question? I see your hands raised. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. I was wondering what type of uh, NLP methods uh, are you employing for your NLP application? Is there any room for such type of uh, transform based models or you know, state of art uh, um, NLP models in your work? Yeah, for sure. And so that's something that my student is working on as part of her master's thesis. So it was funny. So just to talk a little bit about how complicated that project is and negotiating it. So we really needed to show value of our ability to analyze that data. And so within, I think, a week of getting the data, we had good prediction models turned around using standard data science techniques, nothing you know, nothing fancy. And the reason we had to do that was because the hospital said, hey, we're giving you all this data. What are you going to do for us? And so within, I think, a month, we had, you know, we had worked with them and had generated a paper on the data. And so now, because we got that initial data paper out the door that showed some associations in the data, now we can really dig into novel methods of interrogating that data and, and doing um, some different work. The other thing that they did was they just recently last week gave us all the data trended. So now we know for each patient, we know every patient and what's happened to that patient and you know, have the sort of the, the um, radiology reports in a line for all of those patients. So we can look at it kind of over time and do that kind of analysis. So it takes a while just to get data, but to also like to, to kind of get around the politics of some of this, these things that you have to do, which I don't know that graduate students kind of realize the extent of some of that when they, they get involved in the projects. But yeah, so that's the plan is to really um, to push that kind of thing forward. Fantastic. Thank which you. is what we should be doing right now, but we're all, we all have COVID brain and, yeah. and struggling <laughs> to go forward, you know? Thank you.
Any other questions, anyone? All right, well, I see we're coming up to the hour. So um, I'll just thank you so much, Amber. I know there's a lot to chew on in your talk. I'm probably gonna think about the question of, you know, would you want AI to tell you if you're gonna, you know, how long you have to live? I'm gonna think about that all day. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, lots to think about. And uh, yeah, we'll make the recording available um, in a few days once we have time to, to, to trim it down. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much and uh, everyone, please, I don't know, use the applause emoji or, or <laughs> you in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone. And I look forward to getting know, to know everybody, um, which is a little hard to do remotely, but we'll try. I'm excited to work with this group. This is one of the reasons why I came back to the country. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Amber.